So I want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'm really excited about this um, panel that we've put together with three Brooklyn Tech alumni um, who are going to talk to us about their career paths, uh, what they've done, um, a little bit about how JA might have inspired them. Um, and you know we're opening it up for questions at the end. Um, but I guess Tasha, I'm going to throw it off to you for first to start uh, with a little icebreaker, and then um, we'll have you guys introduce yourselves. Sounds good. All right. So I know it's Monday afternoon, maybe not the most favorable time of the week, but I want you all to use the chat feature here on Teams. If you hover your mouse and or click in the middle of the screen, you can see where the chat is. And I want to hear one word that can describe your weekend. So for a minute, we're just going to reminisce about the past two days. What is a word that describes how your weekend went? I think I heard somewhere, read somewhere that reminiscing literally is good for your self care. So, so consider this to your self care for the day if you haven't done anything already. All right, so some of us had a, a lazy Sunday maybe, we had naps, we were inspired. It's too short, I think that we can all relate to that one. Definitely some chores going on long. Oh my gosh, I need to follow your lead here. How do we make our weekends long? <laughs> yeah, figure out these tricks. <laughs> Cleaning, very good, very good. All right, so now that we know how to use the chat box, please use this area. Yes, protesting. <laughs> nice. There we go. Now we know how to use the chat box, definitely use this space to ask questions or interact with the volunteers throughout the session. And I'm going to hop off and go ahead and hand it over back to Carol. Thanks. Thanks, Tasha. All right, so um, I would love to introduce our panelists for today. We've got uh, Charles, Kyle, and Awad. Um, I think you guys know your stories better. So I'm going to throw it off to you for maybe two to three minutes to tell us a little bit of background on, on yourselves um, and what you're up to these days. So Charles, how about we start with you? Yeah. Um, so after graduating from Brooklyn <coughs> Tech in 2008, uh, I went off to California to Stanford where I studied in computer science. Kyle was my roommate for, for two of the years there and we were in some organizations together. Um, throughout Stanford, I was really involved in some entrepreneurial groups on campus, um, and I knew that I wanted to start my own business. We actually had started our own company back in high school, and I knew I wanted to do one again. Um, but after senior, well, in senior year, I wasn't really ready to start my own business uh, then. So I decided to join a, a large organization. I worked at Microsoft for a year and a half, which gave me the opportunity to get more experience, learn some product management skills, save up some money so that I could bootstrap my own startup uh, later on. Um, after a year and a half there, moved back to the Bay Area to start a company with some friends. Um, and after about a year, we sold the company off to Intuit, where I was a tech lead and software engineer for four years. I just left last year to move back to New York and spend, I've spent most of the last year traveling. And now I moved back in Manhattan, um, researching new startup ideas. So that's where I'm at now. Awesome. I'm sure uh, you've had a lot of time to think these days, just being sort yes. of indoors and having nothing else to do but think. It's great for startup research. Yeah. All right, cool. Uh, Kyle? Cool. Um, I'm Kyle. Um, I work with the WAD at uh, Pixley. Um, I guess similar to Charles's story, I graduated at Brooklyn Tech in 2008, um, went out to Stanford uh, from my undergrad. And um, while at Stanford, uh, uh, Pixley, the idea kind of started. Um, and um, when we first started the company, um, Instagram uh, just came out with the Android app at the time. And a lot of people were uh, at the time uh, using, I think, the iPhone 3S or iPhone 4 or something kind of a little bit archaic. And everyone had these really ugly squares around their, their images at the time. And then, yeah. um, you know, I think our story at Pixley is a combination of being in the right place in the right time and having a unique perspective on the industry 
that we benefited from because we were young at the time and really in tune with the changes of social media and how it impacts brands. Um, so I guess we'll get into what Pixie does and later on, but um, you know, we as a result of that we've been um, very active in the marketing community, um, especially around user generated content and influencer marketing as a whole. And that's kind of our area of expertise. And if you think about how those industries have evolved since uh, you know, 2013, 2014, 2015, um, we've played a pretty critical role in that. Okay, great. great. And last but not least, the WAD. Yeah, so also Brooklyn Tech. Uh, I had been, I used to sit next to Charles in computer <laughs> science class uh, way back in high school. Um, and then after that, uh, went off to Baruch College. So I actually stayed in New York City at the time um, and uh, was actually, uh, already uh, using uh, my my skills in computer science to um, basically work for small startups and larger companies. Um, you know, when I wasn't in school, uh, just taking on different projects and really expanding my skills that way. And um, <clears throat> then towards the end of school, got together with Kyle and. Um, you know, started working on Pixly. And since since we've started that, you know, I've worn quite a few different hats. Uh, tends to happen when you start a, a company and you learn a whole lot about things you never expected to learn. And, um, you know, it's been, it's, it's been quite the journey, I'd say, uh, since then. Okay, yes. Um, so I want to start us off by sort of having you look back a little bit um and so knowing what you know now um what would you tell a high school student who's interested in starting a business or or going down the entrepreneurship path um and i guess whoever wants to start us off maybe not all all of you have to answer every question um but you know does anyone want to speak to that I'd love to hear all of your perspectives, though. <laughs> I want to hear Charles' perspective. I heard like a lot, and I talk about this all the time. Uh, really? First. Oh, we're we work together, right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's important to just do something. You learned a lot by just building and getting products out there and trying it out. Even though you know, looking back, we like cringe at some of the stuff that we that we worked on early on. But I think those lessons that we learned were super invaluable. And I think failing when you're in high school is is like doesn't really mean much like you have not a lot to lose and there's not a lot of other opportunities out there so you just kind of create your own opportunities and that really accelerates your learning more than probably anything else that you can do um so i would say just go out if you want to start something don't think that you have to raise money or like uh have all these skills just think about what you can do and, and do it and you'll learn a lot faster that way than anything else yeah yeah i think one one cool fact is the three of us and two two other uh, friends of ours um, were in the inaugural Junior Achievement Business Plan competition. And we, and yeah. we won that. And we, uh, we thought just because we won that, that we would then go <laughs> off and create this massive uh, business. And, you know, that did not do so well. Um, but I think the fact that we did it was important um, because it, it we, we did have a chance to learn a lot. Um, the one thing that is really, really powerful about being young and dipping your toes in the water is people really want to help you out. And you have access to so many uh, mentors or otherwise people that, you know, uh, sometimes may not seem as accessible. Um, and that's invaluable. Just getting that exposure, getting that experience and seeing that you know what, these are just regular human beings. You know, everything's created by another regular human being. And mm -hmm. to me, that that's like so invaluable, you know? Yeah, and I think um, particularly around st starting a company regardless of like how old you are is very challenging, right? Um, yeah. And it's also, it's also a very rewarding experience. Um, I think when it comes to being a young founder in particular, talking about like high school, college, right out of college, um, the reality is that you're already at a huge disadvantage compared to everybody else because of the lack of experience. You have no money. You know, <laughs> it's a lot of it's, a lot, you're, you're, it's uphill battle. Um, but one thing I think is unique about being a young entrepreneur is um, you can use that experience that Wad mentioned um, in college or in high school to really become an expert on anything you want in the world. 
And I think that if you're going to be a successful young entrepreneur, in addition to um, kind of the perseverance that's required at all stages of being an entrepreneur, I think it's also unique, important for you to have a kind of a perspective and a unique perspective that comes with, you know, that level of expertise that can come from something that you see as a day to day user. Or it could be something that you spent the last four years getting really good at because you're in college um, studying something. Okay. Um, I kind of want to build off of that a little bit. So, you know, Charles, you mentioned that you're spending a lot of time thinking about different ventures now. Well, how, as an entrepreneur, do you, like, how do you decide what you're going to go after? What, how do you decipher what's a good idea from what's a mm. bad idea? And there's how do you decide uh, to move forward? Yeah, there's different schools of thought of that. I think when we were in high school, we kind of, try to solve problems that we had. So that was why we built this college admissions tool to help other high school students figure out what colleges they should apply to, like what scores they need to get, because that was a problem that we were having ourselves. Um, so building so something that you think would solve a need that you have personally. Um, mm -hmm. Right now, I'm trying to build something for other people, so not a need that I personally have, but I'm really passionate about the small business space, um, freelancers, people that work for themselves. So that involves just talking to people that are doing that kind of work, that are trying to do that kind of work, learning about the problems that they have and building, just you know, asking them the questions, building prototypes, sharing with them, seeing what they think, seeing if they pay for it. Um, so either go solve something that you have a problem of yourself and that you're the customer of, or find who your target customer is and, and talk to them, learn from them, learn what their problems are, learn what they're willing to pay for. I'm so happy you said that because at JA, our BPC is always centered around a problem. Um, and this year it was, you know, what's a problem your community is facing? So I'm glad to see that there's definitely a connect there. Um, Kyle or Awad, do you want to add to that of like, how do you find the right idea and when, when do you go after it? Well, I think definitely there's different mental frameworks that you can go through just like uh, Charles alluded, and that's probably the most oft-touted one, is solve your own problem. And if it's something you feel really passionate about, then maybe that's a good idea. Um, I don't know that there is a singular way to know when something's a good idea or not. That's, uh, mm -hmm. if you knew that, well, then you know, <laughs> so, it, a so lot of things would happen. I'll, I'll kind of answer this through the lens of Pixley, uh, Wad and I went through, is that I think when we first started the company, it wasn't a good idea. And the reason why is because photo, taking quality wasn't good enough at the time, right? Um, we got lucky how the industry evolved is that smartphone cameras got exponentially better, right? And now everybody, you know, on this call right now has this phenomenal ability to take great photos and videos, and which significantly increased the quality of the images, which then made our, our idea a lot more, <laughs> more, more, more relevant. So I think, um, especially when it comes to building a business, you, you have to realize it, it takes time it's not like, oh, you, you you put together something for two, three weeks and all of a sudden you have like in the next Facebook, right? Like it's always an evolution. And sometimes it takes multiple years for your idea to get any traction. So mm -hmm. with that said, some some another way to think about kind of the uh, startup ideas is to predict wh what do you think is going to uh, change in the future as a result of a new technology. For example, with 5G technology coming out, right? So you can you could think, how is that going to change this area of, of my life that I spent a lot of time thinking about. Mm -hmm. Why did we lose you or <laughs> taking a break? Even lunch, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still, I'm still here. Give me just one second. Sorry. <laughs> okay. No worries. Um, Kyle, do you want to tell us a little bit more about Pixley um, and what it is and sort of, um, how how you guys have have grown the business? Yeah, um, so uh, Pixly, we're a user generated content and influencer marketing platform, and I think what that means is we provide brands with a cost effective way to scale authentic content. So um, if anyone has gone online shopping and you've seen like the customer photos before you bought stuff, and you're mm -hmm. like, wow, like looking at how the customer wore that product or the photo of the hotel that was from a real consumer, um, and that really helped me buy. Uh, we are the technology platform that helps brands 
use that content at scale because um, doing that requires a lot of complexity ranging from legal rights to you know um, different time it's very time intensive if you do it by hand and we mm -hmm. provide software to automate that um, very simply um, that's kind of the simplest way to think about it but today um, we work with brands like Airbnb, Puma, Old Navy, um, Banana Republic, um, Red Bull, um, and a lot of like um, kind of the emerging direct-to-consumer brands um, that um, people here probably uh, have spent time checking out as well. Um, but when the company evolved, um, it didn't start off right um, where it is today. It's definitely evolved over the last few years, and part of that has to do with what we talked about before, which is how photo taking quality got exponentially better because the first two years people were like Kyle the photos are crappy why <laughs> would we use this in our marketing and now like brands can get enough around community right yeah. like, community yeah. it's a hot term and authenticity is a hot term and the more brands um, emphasize e-commerce and digital as a whole um, the greater the demand for content is and anyone who's ever produced content before understands how expensive it is and how time intensive it is. Uh, so what we do is pretty simple. It's, you know, we think that social proof and word of mouth marketing are incredibly important when it comes to how people purchase products, especially uh, for the younger generation as well. Um, and I guess, was there a very definitive moment where you knew all right, this business is growing, technology has caught up to us or caught up to our ideas. Well, like, was it was it like a certain iPhone that came out and you were just like, I know this is the time for us to grow? Or, uh, or sort of, how did you know that it was time to, to build up? Portrait mode. When that, <laughs> when that launched, that was kind of that we're here moment. And it, it wasn't, it was less about us and more about just, you know, everyone being able to now collectively uh, just produce great quality content. And we're seeing, I think, similar with video now. Um, I'm sure everyone on this call is way more, way more in, <laughs> into TikTok and all that than, than I, I am. But uh, you know, you're seeing the same thing happening with video and just uh, the ability to create content is ever more powerful in people's hands. Yeah, I think in, in addition to that, uh, one of the things you'll notice with the rise of different uh, social media platforms that we kind of live through is um, the content creators of these platforms come in all shapes, sizes, ages, ethnicities, diverse, you know, backgrounds, et cetera. And you'll notice that um, some of the most successful creators on TikTok right now, like they're like freshmen in college, right? Mm -hmm. Or they're, they're still high school students, or maybe some people on this call are pretty active on the platform as well. And I think one thing you'll notice is that um, it really democratized that opportunity to be a storyteller and to create content, which then I think allows for different people to be discovered. Um, so that you know, high school student that is now you know has 20 million followers, right? He or she may not even got into her first college of choice, right, <laughs> or second college of choice. Um, but now you know um, the different opportunities that are have arisen because of the platform has grown exponentially. So for us, we are really. I'm excited about um, the role that user-generated content plays in ultimately creating more diverse content as a whole. But please still go to college and don't drop out. <laughs> <laughs> well, sort of in that vein, um, you know, when you guys are looking to expand your teams and grow your teams and add more people, what kinds of skills are you looking for? Um, just sort of to, to make it more tangible for our high school students, what can they start working on or what can they do when they're in college and, and beyond? Like, what are those specific skills? Charles, you're, you're by yourself now. What are you, how, how are you approaching it? Uh, well, in general, there's, of course, like the technical aptitude that you need to have for whatever field you're pursuing. If you're, you know, an engineer, like knowing the programming languages that are relevant to the industry, if you're a designer, Mm -hmm. the tool sets like Photoshop. Um, but I think in general, like traits that we looked at and that I look at when I'm considering co-founders or early employees or just employees in general is one, just the ability to learn. Like if you see them and they're stuck on something, how do they uh, tackle a new problem that they might not have seen before or a new technology or something novel? Because, you know, working on a business and creating a company is about tackling problems that have never been seen before. So mm -hmm. there's not 
like memorizing a book to see what the answer has been that someone else had. You have to be able to solve something new and and having the ability to learn and unblock yourself is really important. And just grit, like there's gonna be a lot of hard times. I know Colin Wada faced a lot of hard times. I've faced a lot of hard times in building a startup and you wanna know that your teammates and the people that you work with will get through that, they'll work hard, they'll persevere, that they'll be patient, be consistent. Um, so I think those are definitely traits. It's hard to, to get to those traits in an interview, but um, that's why there's like different different interview methods coming out that try to single out people that have those traits. Yeah, I think you touched on something very important there, which is even since we were in high school, the the job market and kind of what are the jobs of the current world, it's it's changed so quickly. And that's that's only getting faster and faster. And so that trait, uh, I call it, you know, being an expert at becoming an expert. You know, that's something that ultimately, whether you go into your business for yourself or not, you know, I think just for the jobs of the future, uh, being kind of multifaceted and being able to bring together, you know, all the different things you've accumulated over the years, those are what the jobs are, are going to be going forward. So if you can code, that's great. But if you can code and you know accounting, well, that just makes you so much more valuable. So if you draw a Venn diagram, how many intersecting circles can you create? Right. So I actually think what Awad and Charles talked about with the whole like dealing with ambiguity, grit, um, being able to be a fast learner, like I totally echo all that. Um, maybe, so for my answer, I'll probably um, give us like an example for some of the, the students in the call today um, of how you could differentiate. Let's just say Pixley is hiring for um, um, a, a, a social media manager tomorrow. Um, and there is 100 applicants, right? Um, you have to realize that you're going against a lot of people for a lot of these roles. Um, uh, you can di you can differentiate in different ways. Like For example, there's one thing to say, hey, yes, I, I like social media. Another would be like, check out me. Here are my platforms. Here are how active I am. It's even better if you have a point of view. Like here are three articles that I've written related to social media. Here's my thesis paper related to this topic. <laughs> and it's even better if you can then pair that with actionable ideas for what the brand can do. So for example, if you're coming to the table, instead of just saying, hey, I, I, I'm interested in social media, I don't have the experience, but here's my background of me being involved in this space. And here's three things I would change for your brand if I had this job, right? Like that type of initiative is something that I think all hiring managers care about, especially in an evolving role like digital marketing. Right? Yeah, college applications actually. Yeah, and again, like it's 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 like you have a lot of the resources to become an expert in anything you want today. Right, uh, yeah. And now it's only a question of did you do it or not? Right. <laughs> if you didn't do it, then it's going to be hard. If you did do it, then I think you're going to put yourself in a unique position. Um, and that's why I think uh, it's 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 really advantageous right now for like young people when it comes to um, you know starting their own companies or or you know um, joining businesses. I think that's great advice for the students um, who maybe you know sometimes wait for someone to tell them you know how to approach a problem or what to do rather it's it's more important for them to to think about how they would solve it and take that initiative and have that point of view like you mentioned um one of those things by the way i don't know like if it's taught in school i don't know <laughs> if you were born with it or you learn it but it's one of those things where you either have it or you don't right <laughs> so yeah I think it's yeah one of the really important traits well i think i think that once you realize that it's something that people want you can start to remind yourself like okay here's an opportunity i could take the initiative but um so i do think that it, it, it is a skill that can be honed um i don't want to say that people are, are not necessarily born with it um but okay so you know the when when i think of entrepreneurs i think of people who are uh really disciplined people who follow kind of strict schedules and um sort of are thinking two steps ahead and i'm curious um what your success habits are quote unquote like what what do you think makes you successful what do you do on a personal level that keeps you uh keeps you going and motivated 
And maybe you guys are not those disciplined people. <laughs> yeah. but, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I think one thing that often gets focused on because it's really catchy, and mm-hmm. I don't mean this in a bad way, but I, I just just generally we tend to focus on the one individual because mm-hmm. it makes a good story, right? Like you 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 hear about all these CEOs that wake up at like three thirty a.m. Yeah. You wonder when right. they get to sleep. Um, and they're knocking out emails and all those things. And, and that's great. Like having a, a routine is important. And the key takeaway there is everyone has a different routine. And if you can just make that work with your team, that's the most important thing. But I think another thing that often gets overshadowed is, you know, from a success habit perspective, how do you approach work within your team? So if you are lucky to work with, um, you know, um, uh, co-founders and employees and teammates, are you going into this uh, with, with, with good intentions and are you able to recognize kind of your strengths and their strengths and focus more on that and not just look at it as, I started a business so I'm the boss and therefore you know, everything is gonna go my way. You know, it's more about, uh, for me at least, being able to rely on the people that are around me and knowing what I bring to the table, what they bring to the table and uh, just being able to really amplify that. Okay, fair enough, yeah. <laughs> Does anyone want to add to that? Um, for me, like some things that I've found to be important is like just consistency. I think people, there's like this saying like you, uh, under, you overestimate what you can do in a year and over, underestimate what you can do in a decade. Mm-hmm. And just like com- consistently putting in the work every day, being patient and you'll see the results like over time. Um, that has like proven to be true. And also just, learning from a lot of different sources like i try to be really open-minded try to challenge my assumptions try to you know learn from very different places that other people are learning from um, a lot of successful businesses come because you see something that no one else has seen and you're looking at a place that no one else is looking at like colin wild looking early on at this social space um i was looking early on in the gig economy space like that kind of stuff is important yeah, I've always uh, disliked a lot of the articles that are like, oh, here's an entrepreneur who wakes up at four o'clock every day and eats breakfast and does yoga for three hours and then like, you know, takes a cold shower and then- How all do they have all that time? I just never understand. They don't. They, they don't. don't. There's right? no, okay. And I think it's full of crap because like, don't get me wrong, they might do that occasionally and some people might be more morning people than others, but like, this is, this is definitely like for the article, right? Um, I think, and, and two is I don't think that is what makes- you a good entrepreneur like definitely it's hard work is like critical right i i'm a big believer like you can't get you can't fake that either have that or you don't um but the second part of that is like not quitting and that grit factor i think it's equally important because most people when when things get challenging they quit or they stop doing it right Mm. It, it takes a lot of um conviction to to push through a lot of toughness to push through and last but not least um when you want to build a company um so much of it is not about you it's really about the team that you build right like you're only one person so yes you could wake up at you know four o'clock and you know work 20 hours a day but you're still only one person um how you like lead and build and empathize with the team um is ultimately a lot more important in my opinion um, than just like you pounding the payment for 20 hours a day. Okay, yeah. Um, thank you for that. Uh, I'm so glad we got actual entrepreneurs to discredit all of those. <laughs> <laughs> Another way to think about that, just from like a tactical, like if you're like in high school right now, challenge, yeah. um, I would say, you know, we all have like to-do lists, right? Mm-hmm. Um, here's like the 20 things I need to do. Um, but it's not just about doing those 20 things. It's about making sure you do like the most important things first. Right. So if you do 18 out of 20, but like the two that you didn't do, like were actually really important, like turning in that, you know, final assignment, right? You know, yeah. then you're, you're, you're missing and you're missing out on a lot of, you're, you're missing the, 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 the boat essentially. Yeah. Um, so you talked about challenges and, and not quitting when those come up. So I'm curious, what's the biggest challenge that, that, that's come up for, uh, for you guys in your, in your business ventures and how did you overcome those? Charles? Oh man. Um, 
I think uh, when, when I was working on my company, there was uh, just a lot of competition. And um, I think in the beginning, that was like really overwhelming to see like someone else competing with you in a space. Um, and you can really easily get let that get to your head mm -hmm. and only think about the competition and let that detract from your own um, company and like what you guys are doing and, and playing your own game. Um, so I think it took me a while to, to you know, just get back to, you know, we know what we want to do, we know who our customers are, we know the value we provide, like getting back to do the work and not focusing so much on competition. Like there'll always be competitors out there. Um, they might raise more money than you, they might hire someone that you think is better, they might sign a customer that you wanted, but, um, you know, it's a long game, it's a marathon, it's, mm -hmm. it's a sprint, you have your own wins. Um, just like keep your head down, keep working, and don't worry too much about competition. Yeah. Um, I think also, like, you know, for a wadded eye, like, because we started out of college, like, we just didn't have any money, right? <laughs> so, that's, like, the first thing that comes to mind, right? And I think, um, is that, like, you know, it, it's not like day one, you have an idea, and then all of a sudden, people are giving you millions of dollars to go do it. Like, there's this, like, what I call, like, a very uncomfortable time period between, like, you have an idea to people actually start using it to, like, maybe you can raise funds, or maybe you can start paying yourself, right? Like, that, and that, and that gap is, is very uncomfortable. Um, so, uh, you know, there's always a resource limitation when it comes to starting a company, um, and I think it's, uh, kind of a reality of, of, of the startup world. And, um, you know, my advice is usually like, the, the lower you can bring your, your kind of personal burn rate or your personal expenses, um, I think it's usually the better when it comes to kind of being able to kind of come up with a new idea and ultimately um, get the idea off the ground. I think, though, that, that like cash strap state is kind of an advantage a little bit. It forces you to really prioritize the things that matter the most uh, be really scrappy. Like we, for our startup, we didn't raise any funds. We bootstrapped the whole time. Um, and that really focused us to prioritize to, you know, spend all of our resources very wisely. Um, and you can be more nimble because of that. So you can use that as an advantage, um, depending on your strategy. Yeah. I think we humans have a tendency to look at kind of the, everyone around you and make comparisons. And I think that's really, really, you know, one of the most challenging aspects of, of life, but but especially in business, especially when you're starting up to the point of there might be bigger competitors. And actually that's, having competitors is a good thing. If you're in a space that no one is in, mm -hmm. maybe you may not be in the best space, but if you have <laughs> competitors um, and oftentimes they are better than you, you know, it does force you to, or bigger than you, I should say, it, it does force you to kind of think on like, what is your unique value prop or your unique point of view, as Kyle was saying earlier? Mm -hmm. and, are you able to then really, really focus on that and do that? Because um, the, there's a, a very fine line between perseverance and just kind of insanity, right? Um, so you got to be careful that, but if you have enough conviction in your point of view and you see, you have little kind of markers along the way. For us, you know, especially in the early days, just seeing one more customer give us a trial, you know, one more person go live, you know, on a website, that was a win for us. It, it was those little wins that added up to that feeling that, you know what, we do have something to contribute and we, we're not the biggest yet, but we will be one day. Yeah. yeah. And then, um, the one last thing I'll add is like, understanding what you're not going to do um, from mm -hmm. a perspective, I think is one of the hardest things to decide as an entrepreneur. Um, one of the great things about being an entrepreneur is you can create anything you want. But that also sometimes means that you try to accomplish too much or you lose focus. And I actually think that for a lot of startups, the, the more focus you have, the more successful you're going to be in the beginning. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I see a question in the chat that I was actually going to ask. So, um, Given the current events and um, we know what's going on with the world with both the pandemic and the, the the movement, what kind of impact do you think these will have on the startup landscape? Maybe I'll start, start this one. Um, I think that anytime there's a lot of significant market changes, it's actually good for entrepreneurs. And right. the reason why is when there's drastic changes, um, it means that there's um, a limited amount of experts that know right. how to deal with that. So I'll give you an example, like TikTok, right? It's been around for two, two and a half years. That means that the max amount of experience you can have, let's say marketing on TikTok, 
would be two and a half years. So that marketer that had like 25 years of experience, right? They are now brought back to only two and a half years of, ex of, of experience in that space, which means that it really levels the playing field. So I personally believe that anytime there's change, it actually creates a lot of opportunities for entrepreneurs who have the ability to move fast and understand that market really well. Do you guys wanna, would you like to add to that? Yeah, for me, it's been an interesting time since I'm still in the very early phase of my startup research, but it's also been exciting because there's so many changes happening uh, and trends that, you know, we were looking at, you know, five to 10 years out happening and being accelerated right away, whether that's remote work or, you know, e-commerce, uh, transitioning to e-commerce or telemedicine. So there's a, creating a tons of opportunity in different spaces and people are, are really open to, to all this new technology. And if you look historically, some of the best companies have come out of being started from times of economic turmoil. Um, I think it goes back to that, you know, cash strappedness that I was talking about later a lot before where really the best companies survive um, and thrive in these conditions. And it really forces you to be, be gritty, be diligent, uh, be disciplined. So yeah, I think this is a great time to start a company um, and if you're a good founder, this is a great time to be running a startup. Yeah, I think yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, so I want to, I guess, ask one more question and then I want to open it up to some of the questions we received from the students um, and what's coming through the chat. Um, what's next for you guys? What's on the horizon? I have a 2 p.m. meeting. Um. <laughs> Uh, might be in the same meeting, actually. Uh, Charles, I think, is the is the most qualified to answer this question, uh, given where he's at. Yeah. Uh, so still, successful founder now. I think uh, there are certain things that I had assumed that are no longer true because of coronavirus, like especially in the small business space, which has seen so much change happen. But now new things are true. Um, so I'm hoping to kind of nail down an idea in the next few months and, and start prototyping it with real businesses and, and people out there. And uh, yeah, so it's gonna be interesting next few months. Okay, well, cool. I wish you the best of luck with that. Um, so Kyle and Awad, I feel like you're working on something secretive and you don't wanna talk about it, it's <laughs> totally fine. <laughs> well, I'm moving, I'm moving to New York in two weeks, so okay. there's, there's oh, something. It's gonna be great but to have it back. I think that uh, Charles alluded to something that, you know, the way the world works, you know, it's it's very, it's going to be very different even going forward, you mm -hmm. know, in terms of what does an office mean? We've, we've already been a distributed company. We have offices, you know, scattered all over both the U.S. and, and the world. And uh, just what does that then mean in terms of, you know, where you're located? I think we'll, we'll see mm -hmm. a lot of new, new opportunity happen in, you know, even parts of the United States that have been, uh, under invested in and kind of uh, that have been brutally affected, you know, in their economies. So um, not to say that New York is in that boat, but uh, mm -hmm. being there, I think, you know, while still being able to contribute at Pixley, I think is a, is, is, is a great opportunity. Um, so speaking of Pixley, the, the question from one of the students is, is asking for more detail about the process of creating a company. So uh, when you had your idea, did you immediately pitch to an incubator or did you first create the product and then observe what other people thought of it? Um, you know, I, I think um, it's not like as linear as people think. It's like, oh, I had an idea, then now I built the product and everything was great. The right. reality is the process of coming up with an idea is actually very messy. And the second thing that I think is really important to understand, like your idea when like 98% of the time changes. <laughs> like, and if the other 2% of the time when it, it doesn't change at all, it's because you're probably doing something wrong because the idea always evolves. So I, everyone has different perspectives on this. I personally am a bigger believer in like the test and learn iterations. Um, I think like the Steve, Steve Blank has a lot of really good writing on this as a whole, like lean startup methodology. Um, but I'm a big believer in like kind of testing and learning and then iterating on the fly. Because if you think about Pixel, we've iterated so many times along the way uh, right. that like, you know, the initial idea to now, like it's evolved quite a bit. Yeah, we were lucky that uh, we did have the in-house capability. I, I, I can code. And so we're able to actually make those um, 
experiments happen early. Um, and, I, and, and I'd also say that, you know, the world back then, even now, it was a little bit different in terms of the infrastructure that exists. Like, I, I think the, it's interesting to me that the question includes an incubator right off the bat, because that was a more novel thing back then. And it's great that there is way more infrastructure on it now. But mm -hmm. I'd say don't use don't necessarily look at that as the crutch. There is no yeah, like, yeah. one straightforward uh, way. Um, we got rejected, I think, three or four times for you know previous ideas before we ever got in you know any kind of funding or anything like that. So yeah, but we all did go through the same accelerator. Uh, it's a, a Stanford one called Stardex, and I think that's definitely a good option. Um, but it shouldn't be a roadblock for you starting something or or launching a product. Um, it's useful, like I think we all got value out of it. It helps a lot with the logistical aspects of you know, finding a lawyer, you know, connecting, getting connected to venture capitalists, talking to other startup founders. Um, but yeah, like even the process of applying and getting rejected was useful to us and helping us hone uh, our pitch and, and ask ourselves difficult questions. But it didn't stop us from, from launching or, or building a business just because we did get rejected a few times. Um, and it shouldn't, shouldn't stop you either. Yeah. I always think of that picture on the internet of like what success looks like, and it's just like a bunch yeah. of yep. squigglies. It's not a straight line. Yeah. Um, OK, so I want to pull some questions from the students who submitted them earlier. Um, so we've got a question here. I think this is Imran's question also. So did being at Brooklyn Tech have uh, an impact on you to achieve your goals of creating a company? And what would you recommend uh, a 15 year old do uh, if, if he or she's in interested in starting a company? Man, 15 years old is young. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I'm, trying to, I'm trying to remember 15 right now. <laughs> <laughs> Basketball and like, I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, quite literally, Kyle and myself being co-founders and having met at Brooklyn Tech on the basketball team did contribute. <laughs> so, and then Charles and myself uh, sitting next to each other in computer science class, keeping in touch and doing all that. I, for sure, obviously, you know, the group here, um, Brooklyn Tech contributed, but I think also uh, having access, I think, to just uh, a great network and great group of people, all, all great. 15-year-old, um, <laughs> Read. I mean, CS uh, class was great too, right? Yeah. We we learned how to code at a at a, totally. a really young age and could build stuff, um, which was awesome. I also think like who you who the people you become friends with, right, um, will naturally become some of your first uh, either employees or your first customers or users. Um, so I think that like some of the relationships that I built in high school, right, yeah. uh, you know, I I are some of my closest friends today. And so I would, you don't underestimate that kind of the, the value and that kind of network that comes with kind of a school like Brooklyn Tech, um, because it's becoming, fr being friends with people, right? And kind of building that personal relationship, um, it goes a long way. Let me put, let me just add one thing though. If you're thinking about this at 15, that's really, really great. But don't also put like the burden on yourself at that point where you need to know exactly how to, create this great business idea I you have you know the opportunity uh, to try and experiment without hopefully a lot of consequences and you yeah. you're in school you, you get to learn yeah. stuff um, Burn rate we is so jobs low. Yeah. we have jobs so we're zero. spending eight hours a day at you know doing our jobs you're spending eight hours a day, a day learning stuff so that okay. just soak up everything you can because um, you never quite know where you know that that knowledge will will, will, will take you Great, great answers. Um, and I guess, what about college? We didn't really talk about college. Um, do you guys have any advice on um, on navigating college uh, for our students? Um, I think in general, um, for college, a lot of people are usually in like a rush. Um, like, oh, I need to take all these credits right away. I need to like finish my major as soon as I can. And you know, there's some financial benefits to that as well. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, like when I think about now that we're like several years removed from college, um, when I think about some of the classes I enjoyed the most, um, 
it, it was like this random course that I just found interesting that was not directly within my major. And that's not to say that I didn't like my major or anything like that, but like um, it was a unique time to kind of take whatever class you wanted to, to kind of learn and, 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 and absorb from other people. And when I think about like a lot of the values of higher education, um, some of it is, is just being in the dorm, right, and being at the lunch table and having those kind of conversations with people where you actually learn a lot. Um, it's not just only like the class. Yeah. Definitely, it's, it's kind of that moment where you need to be possibly consider being a bit more uncomfortable than you normally are. Um, that is kind of, I think, the root of a lot of uh, higher education. And you know, especially, I'm not sure ex the exact makeup of the audience, but, you know, New York City tends to be very diverse, a lot of first generation kids going to college. I had that unique perspective being at Farouk, I think there's like 180 languages spoken there or something. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's the first time in your life that, you know, you're an adult. And so I think just putting yourselves in a situation where you can maybe see, a, you know, something you're not, you're not used to, and maybe that's a little uncomfortable, to Kyle's point, you know, take that class that you have possibly no idea how it's going to go, but it might open your eyes to something um, and meet people that you didn't get the chance to meet, you know, growing up. Yeah, that's, that's great advice. Um, Charles, is there anything you wanted to add about your college experience? I think we already alluded to it with high school, but the people are definitely very important. Definitely go to class and, and do the work, but the material is available online. Like, I think a lot of the material is going to be the same from college to college. What's going to be unique is the people that you're surrounded by. And you'll never get the opportunity again to be so close with such a diverse group of people that you're going to be able to see, you know, every day. Yeah. Uh, so that those relationships are, are super invaluable when you're looking for, you know, customers or even like you're, you know, trying to find co-founders, you're looking for advice. Having that network from college is super important. Um, yeah. I think what you're saying today is, you know, college is not for everyone. Right? There's different ways to learn. With that said, however, like if you, you know, become super, super successful, like you still cannot get that undergrad experience. <laughs> yeah. So just keep that in mind. Um, is like I think a lot of people um, have this like really exciting, you know, marketing idea around like, oh, dropping out of college is really cool. But like, you know, there's 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 trade offs to that as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I feel like you kind of just answered one of the, the questions uh, from the chat, but there's another one. Um, was there ever a time when you felt like quitting at any point during the process? All the time. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Once a month, you know. <laughs> once a month. What keeps you going? It's just it's good. the money, maybe. <laughs> it's seeing the realization of what you saw, how, how you saw the world was going to be, and mm -hmm. then seeing that actually come to life. And that has been super validating. Just, oh, yeah, people using our product. That's that's great. That's super validating. And then on the other side, uh, for me personally, uh, seeing my team and uh, seeing kind of their own progress, you know, I have. Uh, people that were my interns that are now, you know, uh, directors and VPs and managing people and seeing their career growth and uh, seeing them be able to go and do great things and push our, our collective vision forward. That's what has to get you through because, you know, anything other than that, it's, look, there's a lot of better ways to make money than start a business. It's, mm -hmm. it's actually one of the big myths, right? Yeah. Um, so... Yeah. I think early on, right, you're really attached to like the mission and what you're trying to do in the space. But as it evolves, I think to Watt's point, a lot of it's around the team, right? Like these are people who like were with you and during your darkest times, they help get you out. And, you know, you want to make sure that they have a good outcome as well. And this is something that's really rewarding in their in their career. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right. So I think um, the last question we have time for is how did being a first generation American uh, or first generation immigrant, if, if that's how you guys um, identify, affect your success or how do you think it did? Is that the case for, for any of you? Uh, I think for all of us. Okay. Wait, wait, what's first generation is like, yeah, first generation is like you were born here, but your parents were, right? 
accident? You were born here. Your parents okay, were not. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 I always forget when the generations start. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, my dad immigrated from the Dominican Republic. Mm -hmm. um, I think for immigrants, it's it's a there's advantages in terms of being an entrepreneur, and there's disadvantages. Like when I was at Microsoft, I was making more money than like my parents ever made. So it was really hard to to leave that and say I'm gonna start something and be making zero dollars and right. not be like fear that like I'm being you know ungrateful for like I can't you know give that money and help my family out. It's like a big risk and also you don't have as much of a financial support network. Like if I did just go out start my own business and you know after a year still wasn't making any money from it, would I be able to you know lean on my family for financial support and for a lot of first generation immigrants who whose family haven't accumulated a lot of wealth yet, that's difficult. Um, so it's definitely a lot of risky, but I do think that the immigrant spirit is very entrepreneurial. Like you left your country and came to a new place. That's like a huge risk to take. You started from nothing. Um, so I do think that, yeah, like immigrants have this entrepreneurial spirit already within them. Yeah. And that is the advantage. I think Charles said it best, and I would just echo kind of what I said in the beginning. This this concept of of really internalizing that you know the world is just created by other people because I think there's this almost imposter syndrome sometimes that can come up where you're not sure if you should be in the room. Um, or at least for me, that that was the case, right? And and really internalizing that no, I also deserve to be in this room and that I also have something to contribute. And um, that's just, I think, something to, to, to get over. Yeah. yeah. I think that's so important for, uh, for young people to hear in general, um, that they do have ideas um, and that their ideas do, do matter. Um, all right, well, we're just about time, and I want to be mindful of everyone's busy schedules. Um, I don't see any other, any other questions in the chat. So I really want to thank you all for your time and for your great advice and just sharing your stories with us. This was a really fun, fun hour. Um, and I wish you all the best of luck in all of your ventures. And um, I, I hope to see you soon with JA. Great, thank you for the opportunity today. Thank you, bye. Have a good evening, guys.